Hello there, I'm Otto Othman and you're tuning to 7 Edition. These are your headlines. Government offers 850 ringgit per square feet to Kampung Baru landowners. PT3 examination may be postponed because of haze. And Deputy Minister at PM's Department, Dato Muhammad Farid Muhammad Rafiq, dies of heart attack. We begin tonight's bulletin with this story. The Form 3 assessment or PT3 examination scheduled to start at the end of this month is likely to be postponed if the air pollutant index API readings hits the very unhealthy level of 300 and above. Education Ministry's Deputy Director General Dr. Ahmad Rafi Kasim said a similar decision would also be taken for other public examinations if the haze continues to worsen. Dalam SOP kita, sama seperti penutupan sekolah Sekiranya mencecah 200, maka sekolah itu ditutup Namun, kalau ada perperiksaan awam, perperiksaan berpusat Maka perperiksaan itu akan diteruskan sehingga uh, tahap 300 Itu dalam SOP semasa Namun, uh, kita doakan tak sampailah kepada uh, uh, nilai uh, IPU yang lebih tinggi The written papers for the PT3 examination are scheduled to begin on September 30th and the exams would go on until October 8th. It was reported that thick smoke, which began enveloping several parts of the country about two weeks ago, forced the closure of more than 2,000 schools, affecting 1.7 million students. To ensure students' learning is not affected by school closure, the ministry has provided free digital learning platforms via its portal. Now, the haze shrouding the country is expected to improve as the monsoon transition phase begins next week. Now, according to Malaysian Meteorological Department, thunderstorms and showers are expected to occur nationwide, bringing a much-needed respite from the choking haze. Now, in a statement, Met Malaysia Director General Jailan Simon said the transition phase of the monsoon is expected to begin on Tuesday and last until early November. During this period, regional areas in the country will receive low-speed winds from various directions which has the potential to form thunderstorm. The same weather conditions are expected to occur in the west coast of Sabah as well as the west coast and central part of Sarawak. The weather condition also has the potential to cause flash floods and damage weak infrastructures. Members of the public are advised to be more alert during this period and always stay updated with weather predictions and warnings issued by the department. Deputy Minister in the Prime Minister's Department, Dato Dr. Muhammad Farid Muhammad Rafiq, died this morning from the heart attack. The Tanjung PI Member of Parliament passed away at Pontian Hospital around 6 a.m. He was 42. Dato Muhammad Farid was laid to rest at Wakaf Sheikh Haji Ahmad Kampung Chokoh Muslim Cemetery at Sirkat near Pontian at 5.30 p.m. The young Lepatuan Agong, Al Sultan Abdullah Riyaya Tudin Al Mustafa Billah Shah, was among those who conveyed their condolences to the family. Sultan Abdullah also hoped his family members would stay strong and patient in facing this test from the Almighty. Following Dr. Muhammad Rafid's death, a by-election will be held to elect the new representative for Tanjong PI. In the last general election, he won the parliamentary seat by defeating MCA's Wee Jek Singh and passed Nordin Othman with a majority of 524 votes.
Four, teens, four teenagers allegedly battered a 20-month-old girl to death in Sampona Sabah after she would not stop crying. The suspects, three Filipinos and an Indonesian, have been arrested and being investigated for murder. The incident happened yesterday at Kampung Egan Egang on Bum Bum Island. The four suspects, aged between 16 and 19, were babysitting the toddler. According to Semporna Police Chief Superintendent Sabarude Rahmat, when the girl would not stop crying, the teenagers began slapping the girl, threw her onto a bed and then stepped on the toddler's back. When the girl's mother returned home around noon, she saw her child was weak, pale and did seem to be breathing. She took her daughter to the Semporna Hospital but the toddler was pronounced dead about six hours later. The Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, MACC, was lauded the use of body cameras on enforcement officers such as the police, immigration and customs to tackle abuse of power and corruptions. Its chief commissioner, Latifa Koya, said the use of the body cameras has nothing to do with the human rights because transparency involves the basic rights of all. cakap dua versi. Satu versi daripada penguatkuasa ataupun pegawai, satu versi daripada orang yang dikatakan jadi mangsa kepada salah satu kuasa. Jadi tanpa kamera, siapa kita akan percaya? Kita tak tahu. Anybody can uh, can make up stories, anybody can uh, 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 give their version of what happened. Latifa further stressed the use of the body camera was necessary for transparency and it could raise suspicion if it was not functioning. She added a body camera could not only protect the public but also police personnel on duty if lab label or accusations cropped up. On Thursday, the government said it had agreed to implement the use of body cameras on law enforcement officers to overcome issues of misconduct. The government has offered to buy out Kampong Baru landowners at a rate of 850 ringgit per square feet as it seeks to jumpstart the redevelopment of the oldest Malay enclave in the heart of the federal capital. Federal Territories Minister Khalid Abdul Samad said the rate is the best and highest price offered based on an assessment undertaken by the Valuation and Property Services Department. The minister made the offer during a town hall session attended by some 3,000 landowners and their heirs at the Dewan Perdana Felda in Kuala Lumpur this morning. Based on the offered price, landowners who own up to 8,000 square feet of land could receive up to 6 million ringgit, excluding the buildings or assets on the land. The landowners also have the option of converting the cash offer into affordable home units to be built at the enclave. A combination of cash and a completed unit, as well as shares in a company, which will serve as a special purpose vehicle in connection with the redevelopment project. Uh, kita kena ambil kira bahawa uh, pembelian harga pembelian mesti uh, satu harga pembelian yang memungkinkan projek ini uh, boleh berjalan. Ya, uh, kalau kita beli uh, dengan harga yang uh, mahal. Uh, akhirnya kita pun kena jual dengan harga yang mahal. Ya. Uh, sedangkan kita kata kita nak supaya uh, apa yang kita bina, uh, hartanah yang baru ini, rumah-rumah yang baru, pejabat-pejabat yang baru, semuanya <coughs> kekal uh, milik uh, Melayu. Ya. Uh, so bila kita ambil kira itu, maka kita beli dengan harga uh, yang mengambil kira syarat uh, pemilikan itu iaitu harga yang kita beli adalah hartanah orang Melayu supaya kita bangunkan untuk kita jual pada orang Melayu juga. Ya. In April, Khalid said that the government will fork out between 6 billion and 10 billion ringgit to acquire all land in Kampung Baru and speed up the redevelopment plan which has been stalled for decades by ownership tussles. According to the Kampung Baru Development Corporation, the estimated gross development value for the enclave is between 50 billion and 60 billion ringgit. Kampung Baru was gazetted on January 12, 1900 and administered under the Malay Agricultural Settlement. It covers a 120 hectare area which is around three times the size of the land of KLCC with six integrated villages. While in a video message to the landowners, the Prime Minister
said to Dr. Mahathir Mohamad said Kampung Baru will end up being sidelined from modern progress, which is taking place in surrounding areas of the Malay enclave if it continues to oppose redevelopment. If the 120-year-old enclave does not embrace change, he said it would continue to exist in contradiction with its modern surroundings. Kepentingan orang Melayu termasuklah kepentingan sosial, ekonomi, warisan, adat, budaya dan nilai sejarah akan diberi keutamaan dalam setiap pembangunan yang hendak dilaksanakan. Dalam keadaan sekarang, sebahagian besar orang Melayu sendiri tidak lagi memilih untuk tinggal di Kampung Baru. Lebih malang lagi, warga asing telah mula mendiami dan menjalankan perniagaan di Kampung Baru. The Premier also said Kampung Baru would be better off if it was properly planned and redeveloped with complete infrastructure and network of green spaces provided for recreational and community activities. This, in turn, would be able to draw in more Malays to live in the enclave as well as increase value of its property prices. Previous reports had said that the proposed Kampung Baru redevelopment would be on par with buildings located within KLCC, which comprises offices, premium retail space, luxury hotels and apartments, and convention facilities. When we return, Hong Kong protesters again clashes with police. The details next. Welcome back. Now for world news. Tear gas and confrontation with police could be seen during the 16th consecutive weekend of the anti-government protest in Hong Kong on Saturday after protesters hurled a petrol bomb towards the police line. Now, authorities are also bracing for another round of potential protest chaos in the Chinese-ruled city this weekend after pro-China groups started to clean up the so-called Lenin walls while anti-government demonstrators have vowed to defend them. Hong Kong police fired volleys of tear gas to disperse protesters marching in the sweltering heat after the pro-establishment groups started to pull down the Lenin walls of anti-government messages. Some 4,000 police officers were deployed in the case of violence in the new territories and clashes across the city between the two opposing protest groups. Footage also shows protesters removing fences, destroying surveillance cameras and setting up barricades. Some demonstrators were also spotted carrying U.S. flags and signs calling for President Donald Trump to liberate Hong Kong. A call to join a global anti-totalitarianism march on September 29th was also seen on a banner. Hong Kong has been rocked by demonstrations sparked by a proposed extradition bill since March. Despite the law being withdrawn, the protest has evolved into a movement with wider grievances. In Egypt, Cairo's Tahrir Square saw hundreds gathered protesting against President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi on Friday evening in response to corruption allegations against him and his government. At least five arrests were made in the demonstration as more protests reportedly occurred in other cities across the country. Demonstrators chanted, peaceful, peaceful, and Sisi should go in a rare show of dissident. Such demonstrations are rare after Egypt effectively banned protests under a law passed following the 2013 military ouster of ex-President Mohamed Morsi. Amid a heavy security presence, protesters were rounded up where at least five were arrested and police firing tear gas at demonstrators around the square. The protests come on the back of exiled businessman and actor Muhammad Ali, who accused the country's leader and the military of rampant corruption, demanding him to step down. Abdel Fattah, who came into power in 2014, flatly denied the allegations last week at a youth conference assuring Egyptians he was honest and faithful to his people and the military. Under the rule of general-turned-president Sisi, who led Morsi's ouster, authorities have launched a broad crackdown on dissidents, jailing thousands of militants as well as secular activists and popular bloggers. A bomb planted on a bus killed 12 and wounded several others near Iraq's holy city of Karbala on Friday. 
Reports said emergency services were delaying, were dealing with casualties at a hospital nearby, at a nearby hospital, delivering the wounded to wards and transferring body bags to the morgue. Now, the bomb was said to have been detonated remotely at an Iraqi army checkpoint north of the city. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack so far. The bombing took place during a holy period marked by Shiites between two religious events, Ashura and Arbin. Karbala, around 80 kilometers south of Baghdad, receives visits from Shiite pilgrims during this time of year. United States Defense Secretary Mark Esper said Friday that the country will send reinforcements to the Gulf region at the request of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. This following attacks on Saudi oil facilities, which it blames on Iran. The Pentagon chief said an Iranian attack on an American spy drone in June after Tehran seized the British oil tanker combined with the attack on two Saudi oil installations last Saturday represents a dramatic escalation of Iranian aggression. He added, to prevent further escalation, Saudi Arabia requested international support to help protect the kingdom's critical infrastructure. The United Arab Emirates has also requested assistance. Esper also said, in response to the kingdom's request, U.S. President Donald Trump has approved the deployment of its troops, which will be defensive in nature and primarily focused on air and missile defense. U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff Joe Dunford also stated that the deployment to the region would be moderate, but did not specify the type of equipment or exact number of reinforcements, except that it would be fewer than thousands of troops. As the haze continues to envelop Malaysia, Thailand and Indonesia, Singapore is also not spared. A grass fire about the size of a football field broke out near Jurong Town Hall Road on Friday, making the haze situation in the state, island state even worse. Singapore Civil Defense Force SCDF said in a statement that it received a call at about 5 p.m. alerting it to the fire near the exit to the Ayer Raja Expressway. A video shared on Facebook that was taken from above showed that what appears to be thick plumes of smoke rising from the open field with several torch trees as well as a few isolated blazes. The fire was fully extinguished later by the SCDF using water jets. No one was injured in the incident. Coming up, daylight robbery sparks outrage among netizens. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Thank you for staying with us. Now, let's head on over to our clickbait where we take a look at what's trending and making rounds in the cyber world today. A video surfaced on Wednesday which saw parang, parang wielding robbers breaking into a furniture store as shopkeepers desperately fend for them their safety, reaching out at anything they could grab around them to stall the thieves. The three minute CCTV footage went viral with over 120,000 views, drawing netizens to urge the authorities to take action. Here's the story. According to the CCTV's timestamp, the incident occurred on September 14th at around 1.55 p.m. The robbers rode to the storefront of the furniture store in a motorcycle and charged to the front door. Fortunately, a male shopkeeper was there in time to hold the glass door, but eventually lost against the two men in the game of tug-of-war. The thieves brandishing machetes relentlessly muscled through the store as both shopkeepers armed themselves with any furniture they could get their hands on. This frightening robbery was eventually picked up by Chinese news site Kuanghua, but it was not reported where the incident happened. The Chinese Daily wrote that both shopkeepers were unhurt in the incident after offering all the valuables in the shop for the robbers to take. A netizen called on the police in the comments, urging action to be taken against the robbers. 
while another called out on the thieves to not be lazy and just get a job. Thousands of activists fanned out across beaches and rivers throughout Asia and the rest of the world on Saturday, picking up rubbish and drawing attention to the amount of trash that is dumped worldwide. The mass cleanup came a day after millions marched to urge world leaders to act on climate change. The volunteers turned out for World Cleanup Day, an initiative that has got millions into the streets and cleaning up litter across the globe since it began just over a decade ago. The Pacific Island nation of Fiji swung into action early, with people scouring palm-fringed beaches for rubbish, heavy discarded car tires and engine parts from the coast just west of the capital Suva. The campaign attracted around 1,400 volunteers in Vietnam capital Hanoi, where they scoured different areas of the city for litter under the scorching sun. In the Philippines, some 10,000 people swept across a long stretch of beach on heavily polluted Manila Bay, clutching sacks they filled with rubbish. Elsewhere, in Hong Kong, 55,000 people took part and got rid of trash on land as well as water surfaces. Other countries that took part included Turkey, Comoros, Bhutan, India, Japan and many more. Plastic pollution is a major problem across Southeast Asia, with many of the countries in the region, including the Philippines, China, Vietnam and Indonesia, frequently listed among the world's worst offenders. The mass cleanup is coordinated by the Let's Do It Foundation, which aims to connect and empower people and organizations around the world to make our planet waste-free. According to a United Nations report in 2018, 79% of the plastic ever made has ended up being dumped. Only 9% of the 9 billion tons of plastic the world has produced has been recycled. Just one day to shape the world.